I'd like to invite uh, Rick Pate from uh, Lilly to uh, manage the questions. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate everybody uh, writing and eating at the same time. Uh, I know uh, the discussions have been very lively at your table, so I, I appreciate the questions that you've submitted, and we've got a, f a few to start off with. The first one is for each of our speakers, how do you rate your country's efforts for intellectual property protection? And what, Professor Wu, do you want to start first and just go down the line? Okay, that indeed intellectual property issue, uh, particularly in, in China, is uh, a critical issue. It's not only for multinationals like drug producers in Lili and software producers Microsoft. I would like to use example of my own because the uh, Guanghua School of Management at Peking University is the premier business program in China. But on the same campus of Peking University campus, we discover there are a number of groups who recruit students as executives and charge them and provide a similar pro program like us. So last two weeks ago, we put a full page ads and the leading newspaper in China said, we have not yet authorized any person or any organization to recruit on our behalf. <laughs> because actually, th that shows how serious uh, the situation in China, not only for multinationals, but for domestic organizations like the pre premier uh, business school in China. But now, the issue here, there are the laws and patent laws and uh, intellectual property laws, but the critical issue is the enforcement. As long as the general awareness of this will hurt the Chinese economy, hurt everybody, it's, uh, I think it's still some way to enforce the law. The laws are in place, but how to enforce it is a challenge. Okay, Devinder? Well, I have uh, more or less the same response. The the laws are in place, and India has uh, one of the finest or the best implemented copyright law in the whole world. Uh, it's even more stringent than the U.S. copyright law in many ways. In terms of product patents for the pharmaceutical industry, as part of the WTO negotiations, India had negotiated a 10-year transition period which came to an end in uh, January 2005 and product patents have now been introduced in a very modern uh, patent bill uh, which uh, <coughs> takes into account the uh, aspirations of the Indian industry but also takes into account India's commitments to the world bodies. Uh, the issue is that uh, our legal and judicial system is not geared to handle multiple uh, trade and, prop uh, and intellectual property related uh, laws and disputes. We also have a dearth of patent examiners uh, who will grant the patents when they are filed in India. At the time of uh, implementing the pharmaceutical patents, uh, we had only to totally about 260 odd uh, patent examiners. And in real sense, they were only about 80 or 90. And the requirement was close to 400 or 500. So there is a mismatch between the requirement and the infrastructure which is gearing up. Uh, as I said earlier that uh, the legal system will get enforced, but in the, in, in the interim due to these gaps that I mentioned, there will be some violations, but the, eventually the law will reach them. And uh, so it's very clear that law will be enforced in line with our commitments to the international forum. Well, this is uh, one of the weaknesses uh, of our society. It is uh, something we can it. Uh, and uh, again, there is a great difficulty in enforcing law and having the mechanisms to, to have it uh, implemented. It will take some time for the uh, authorities and for the whole system to uh, carry out effective protection in this regard. And it's something that uh, we have to be uh, persistent and uh, to a certain level patient uh, when uh, dealing uh, or carrying out business in Brazil. This is a reality and cannot be denied. 
Let me make uh, uh, two different comments on uh, IPR in both India and China. Um, I think from the, a, a functional perspective, uh, as Devinder has said, in, in India in particular, the laws are now in place. So the jury's still out. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how it plays out in implementation and enforcement over the coming years. Um, but uh, India has, uh, has, except for a little blip at the beginning of this, with some, which I won't get into right now, uh, has indeed uh, made a, uh, a commitment to enforce and to put in place their intellectual property rights. In China as well, along with WTO accession, came all of these beautiful new laws. And uh, so the laws, in fact, are in place. Um, however, the system of the rule of law and the courts in, uh, in China, I think, still leave a great deal to be desired. And culturally, in both countries, intellectual property rights are something that are not ingrained in people's, uh, in the fabric of society and in people's uh, psyche. Um, so that's, you know, that's the, the uh, technical side of it. The practical side of it is, is that I currently have uh, three lawsuits uh, on IPR in India, and I have, I think, 15 now in China. So that's the practical side of things. Yeah. Well, with, uh, with respect to Russia, <clears throat> I don't claim to be an expert on intellectual property rights. I think I remember reading somewhere that the second largest export from Russia behind oil and gas is counterfeit DVDs and CDs. <laughs> but uh, I, I think like anything with Russia, uh, they do want to become a part of the World Trade Organization, and with that comes a uh, requirement for honoring uh, international licenses. And uh, that is something where I don't think they have the necessary laws in place yet. And even if they were in place, I don't think they're doing a very good job of enforcing them. But uh, that is something you have, I have read in a number of cases about uh, a desire on the part of Russia to get there. It will just take time. And I think we'll be part of this overall movement to try to get, become a part of the world economic community. Uh, just so I can make yeah. one other comment, sure. too, not so much on what are IP protections, but um, ways that I think you can respond. The traditional uh, way that a lot of uh, American and foreign companies respond is, you know, let's go to court, you know, uh, deal with our patents in court. But I think there are also other constructive ways that you can respond as well. Um, we've had patent or uh, uh, IP issues with smaller components, turbochargers, uh, filters, things like that, primarily in China. Um, and we've responded a couple different ways. Of course, if there's a clear a legal opportunity, we'll go for that. But we've also taken uh, commercial actions. Um, and we figure in a, a, a machined product such as ours, if somebody else can make it cheaper, you know, copy it and make it cheaper than we can, we ought to be just as cheap as they are. So we tend to go after them on a, a, a pricing uh, a price as well. And I think you, you just cannot rely solely on legal uh, legal protection in order to bolster your prices. You've got to go after it commercially as well. Sure. Thank you. We have three questions that are sort of related, and they all deal with people as Indiana businesses. The questions are, how does an Indiana company decide whether to set up a JV or go it alone in each of your countries? Does an Indiana com how does an Indiana company get started in identifying possible partners? And what are the most challenging aspects of getting up a business in your, in your country? And Professor, we will start with you. So do you go it alone, or do you go with a joint venture partner, and how do you, how do you find the business in your country? But let's say uh, 15 years ago, I think joint venture probably there's only viable options. But now, I think many of, as of this uh, foreign direct investment, the companies set up in China now is go to the wholly foreign-owned enterprises. Because uh, now, that does not uh, exclude joint ventures. But early years, joint ventures partners, many of the partners are state-owned enterprises, were state-owned enterprises. But now, there are a number of uh, private-owned enterprises are also willing to partner with, let's say, uh, companies from Indiana to explore the market, give the complement assets and the market knowledge, other things. I think still, there are institutions, I suppose, in Indiana, as well as in China, to facilitate that uh, market entry. I think in Beijing, 
Indiana State has an office as the economics and the commercial office I had contact with before I came here. And actually, that can provide some information. And I think this school here, there are also some professors know China well. I think that can help us, help some of those companies to venture uh, into China, even on the individual basis, on, on, the, on the move it alone basis. Okay. <clears throat> it depends on the industry segment, I would say, whether you would like to go alone or find a partner in India, and also the level of investments and the business case that you have. But uh, it's perfectly possible to go alone, because in most sectors now, uh, India allows majority or 100 percent foreign direct participation or ownership, which was a constraint in earlier years, that certain sectors were not open to 100 percent ownership. So you were forced to find a joint venture partner. And there was a very draconian law which recently got changed that when you had a joint venture partner, if you wanted then subsequently to set up another division of your company, an independent 100 percent subsidiary of another business or another division of the same company, you had to get a clearance from your existing uh, joint venture partner. And that was in most cases withheld by the joint venture partner. And therefore, the 100 percent subsidiaries did not come about in India. That law also has been changed and repealed by our Prime Minister recently. So you can go alone. Now, how do you go about it? Uh, India has a very well-developed infrastructure of investment banks. There are all the international banks are available, uh, investment banks. They can do a study, feasibility study. All the uh, consulting houses are available. Then there are many small boutique Indian investment banks who are not as expensive as a Merrill Lynch or a McKinsey or a Boston Consulting will be. They are very, very tuned to the ground. You can hire them to do a small study. They can help you find partners. They can even help you find acquisition candidates. Because as I mentioned, there are about 3,500 software companies. Uh, and so what some of the software uh, multinationals are doing, they are registering their own subsidiary, but also acquiring some small companies, and therefore building a base which is ready-made available. So I think that way the financial services market is so well developed that you won't have a problem. The constraints are the infrastructure and some of the government permissions, which can become quite nagging at times. But in many of the new age industries, the government is almost non-interfering, so you can just start on your own. In the case of Brazil, uh, with the exception of a few restricted sectors, there are no uh, particular restrictions uh, to whether you go alone with your company or you establish a, a, a joint venture or other form of association. So it, is, it would be mostly a question of assessing the market and establishing your way to go your business case. It can be supported. Uh, the presence of American industries in Brazil is very, very strong. Trade associations are quite uh, well known and powerful. You can make uh, good use of them. The American Brazilian Chamber of Commerce is particularly very active in Brazil. As far as uh, difficulties, uh, I would uh, nominate number one instability of rules. This is a problem still in Brazil. Uh, regulations uh, in many, many fields are not well established, and this, uh, this is a problem for investors. Uh, uh, the bureaucracy associated to uh, initiating a new business and uh, the, some peculiarities of uh, our legal system, this is also uh, something to be overcome. Unfortunately, uh, this is something that uh, does, does exist and affects uh, everybody, independently of being foreigner or, or, or not uh, a company. This uh, is a difficulty that affects every Brazilian and foreign entrepreneur. Let me speak about Russia. Um, <clears throat> I would say that both, uh, both avenues are open in Russia in terms of either uh, direct investing or going through a joint venture. My experience would suggest that for new businesses starting up, Probably going the joint venture route is a preferable route. 
with a caveat, and that caveat has to do, you've got to be very, very careful who you select as a partner in Russia, uh, because you can uh, start marching down a street where you don't want to go. Um, and that uh, comes, but, but the reason for that, or the reason for the advisability of having a joint venture partner or a significant component of your company being Russian is to understand the very complex regulatory framework and bureaucracy that exists in Russia. It is, it is uh, complicated beyond your wildest imagination. Uh, there are conflicting rules, there are conflicting laws, and it takes quite a skill and art to be able to navigate through that successfully if you're going to get your business mission accomplished. Uh, generally, Westerners, foreigners do not understand those concepts. Uh, we don't understand the way Russian regulators work, and you have to have Russians talking to Russians to be able to get there. And, I, and I'm not saying that from the standpoint of bribing somebody. Uh, I'm saying that from the standpoint of just simply thinking like Russian regulators think. It is a different way than we think, and in order to be successful, you have to have that edge. So joint ventures can bring that very quickly if you pick your partner carefully. And if you don't pick your partner, you better have some very good, talented Russians with experience in that line of the business working for you. And uh, that will help you navigate through the bureaucracy of uh, permitting and uh, other requirements of doing business there. Uh, just a couple of comments to bolster what's been said. Uh, the foreign embassies, the Chinese embassy, the Indian embassy, or the consulates in Chicago, um, I have branches, and they actually have a, a mandate uh, to try to attract businesses to these countries. So don't underestimate the help that you can actually get from the foreign embassies here and the foreign consulates here in the United States. I would also say there's another thing you really mustn't underestimate because it's probably the best entry there is into these countries, and that's your neighbors from China and from India, because the network in amongst the Chinese community here in Indiana is extremely strong and the same for the Indian community and they have direct contacts back to their home countries and they can be extremely extremely helpful to you in providing advice uh, and contacts yes Steve yeah it's uh, even uh, larger companies have a lot of joint ventures I mentioned earlier we have 38 of them and I'm not sure how many uh, Lily has you've got quite a number we try to buy them all out. We try to buy them all. Okay. <laughs> We've actually been um, very successful at maintaining some of ours at 50-50, but ours can vary anywhere from $1 million in invested capital to $125 million in invested capital. And I think the important thing as you go forward on it, um, just to add a couple comments to some that they made here as well, um, what do you really need the joint venture for? Is it just entry into a particular market, or is there a particular skill that's complementary? to what you have to offer as you go into that market. Just be clear about why you're doing it. And then uh, shared values and objectives. Um, you, yeah. you talked about it in terms of going down a, a path that you don't want to go down. Uh, there are many potential partners that you have and uh, who could have a completely different set of objectives than you do, very uncomplimentary to what you have, and may have a completely different set of values. So just be real clear-headed about it. Okay, thank you. A couple of questions for Professor Wu here. How much longer will the Chinese currency be pegged to the U.S. dollar? Uh, and, <laughs> and can you be which, quoted on that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go slowly now so we can copy it down here. <laughs> so. Greenspan and uh, I think the U.S. Uh, uh, commerce, uh, I think Congress gave Chinese government, I think, three months, right? That's uh, 90 days to <laughs> unpack the, the currency. But as, as they say, that is a uh, Chinese authorities, uh, now the situation here is that say they would uh, not bend, at least show to bend to external pressure, to less external pressure to dictate its monetary policy. Mm -hmm. So that is a kind of the game and both sides, uh, I mean, actually all sides are, are playing. I think that is a, uh, if that is a, with current <coughs> PAC system, actually 8.28, 8.3 RMB to a one US dollar, serves China well. I think that China has no intention in a hurry mm -hmm. to uh, change that. I think it depends on how, what kind of uh, pressure that the, the U.S. businesses and, uh, and uh, others uh, 
trying to change it. But one important thing here is uh, that why the Chinese economy and the Chinese, in that case, had a lot of things to say because many multinationals that invested in China are not happy to see the Chinese uh, currency to be substantially sure. revaluated. Sure. Because the first group to stand up to against the Chinese currency revaluation is from Morgan Stanley. If you represent that the American interest already invested in China, they p put their production manufacturing in China, and they, if the Chinese currency revalues substantially, so they have to consider reallocate and adjust them. That would be very costly. Okay. Great. I have a question for Steve McVeigh now. Steve, since Russia has a very large natural gas reserves, would you be able to elaborate on the national gas sort of downstream investment that's going on in the country? Obviously, they've got the reserves. Are they going to be, as a country, be able to uh, simulate uh, with distribution systems, filling stations, um, liquid you know, gas in their homes and, and businesses? Are, are they working on that end as well as the discovery end? Um, that still is a big issue, infrastructure, distribution pipelines, particularly for natural gas. Um, one of the major pipeline projects that's being discussed right now is a, uh, a pipeline uh, under, I think, British Petroleum is leading this project in the Kudvikta area. And it's a pipeline to the east that ultimately would terminate in Korea and potentially supplying gas to China as well. Uh, the strategic interest of Russia is to actually use that pipeline as a springboard to supply natural gas to the eastern areas of their country because they really would like to take some of their population away from the west of the Urals and move it over into eastern Russia to populate some of these areas. And they see uh, uh, supply of natural gas as being an incentive to do that, to locate businesses there. Uh, and uh, keep, keep one thing else in, in mind. Russia's internal energy prices, particularly natural gas, is about one-fourth of what the world market is right now for natural gas. So uh, there is quite a bit of waste of energy inside Russia today because it is cheap. And uh, that is another issue, I think, that Russia is going to have to contend with if they want to get uh, into WTO, is this uh, uh, national subsidy of energy levels uh, for its domestic uh, market. Uh, so I would say that there remains to be a lot of infrastructure work that has to be done, uh, and there's plenty of supply, but right now there's not that much investment being done to actually either become more efficient at saving energy internally or distributing it into areas where they need it the most. Okay. Thank you. A question for Steve Chapman. Given the significant percentage of Cummins um, that com income that comes out of uh, China and the growth there has been very high. What is Cummins doing to ensure that there's a backfill for key positions to minimize the risk that keep people leaving um, uh, China and, or, and having a negative impact on the business? I wonder if some of our own employees asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we had a... Uh, you, you can address that after the meeting. Yeah, I'll take care of that one after the meeting. No. We um, actually, uh, that's uh, anybody who does business uh, in any major way in China, that is absolutely one of the key, uh, I wouldn't say roadblocks, but key issues that you have to deal with. Uh, there are some really outstanding people in China who are available, uh, really excellent managers, good technical capability in almost every facet of our business. Uh, the key is finding and keeping them. Uh, we have had some very good success so far in doing that, but a lot of it, um, of course, obviously you have to have competitive pay, but you also need a, a sense of loyalty to the organization. Um, very few foreign companies have been able to achieve that. We felt we've, we've generated a measure of that kind of loyalty in order to maintain people. In terms of filling the pipeline, well, what we tend to target is we do not, um, just to be frank, we don't typically hire people right out of school. We typically hire people who've already had one or two jobs, uh, have already jumped around a little bit and are, know what they're looking for, kind of late 30, uh, late, late 20s, early 30s. Uh, and then we um, uh, have, you know, development programs, training programs, and we offer really opportunities for growth. And I think when Cummins is growing at this kind of size uh, that we are and at the rapid pace, you do have uh, chances for upward mobility. However, given that growth speed, we are uh, trying to attract more general manager level people, bringing them back uh, to the U.S. and 
Recently, this, this past week, we've also been talking about sharing our uh, resources in China, India, and Russia, and having some of our managers training, uh, Chinese managers training in India, uh, Russian managers training in China, uh, things such as that. So we've got a lot of really good esprit, esprit de corps going among those three countries uh, in sharing resources. Good. Thank you.